This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter. I may not sound like it because I'm still under the weather here as of this recording, but we got too many people that we need to get talking to, so we're going to get right to it, and hopefully they do most of the talking in these interviews. We'll see. I think I got the right guys uh, lined up for that. Uh, but first, please check out everything at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. You can find this and other shows. You can subscribe to the Indie Mayhem Show on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Play Podcasts, and video versions on the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook and YouTube page. You can also drop us a line at GoodTimes at WrestlingMayhemShow.com or 412-206-WMS0. If you have any suggestions on who we should talk to on the show, any questions for anybody come up, or if you just want to say hi, at Mayhem Show on the Twitter, a great Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook group. And, of course, thank you so much to everybody on Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. That's been literally helped keep the lights on here in the Sorgatron Media Studios. So this week, as we were talking about uh, beforehand, um, this is a name that I've heard around the local Pittsburgh wrestling scene for a good long time. And uh, finally, I, I, you know, saw him at a couple of shows, and I think we were talking online or something yeah. like that uh, afterwards. And I knew I had to get him in for one of these shows. So Marcus Mann is joining us here in studio. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a while. We've, uh, like I said, we've met like a couple times at shows, and then... Mm-hmm. Um, I had been doing uh, Connor's podcast. And I think I did BC Steel's podcast, and that's kind of how we started. That was the big thing, I think. Yeah, yeah it was. A, I, I listened to one of uh, Wrestling with Deaths with, with you on there, and I'm yeah. just like, okay, this is interesting. Like you, you're, you, you're like some of your concepts around wrestling yeah. were really interesting. So I'm like, okay, we have to have a conversation, and I wish I had more <laughs> to converse with right now. No, but, that's fine. Uh, but anyways, uh, just for people, you know, a little break the ice question, of course, to start off the show. Uh, what's your earliest memory? Excuse me. Tried it again. What's your earliest memory of professional wrestling? Um, so like, uh, as you'll learn with me, if you've listened to me on podcasts, everything's like always like it's twofold. It's threefold. This is a twofold. Like this is kind of twofold. So like, when I was really really little, um, I can remember professional wrestling in my household. So like, I remember having like um, you know, thumb warriors with like Hogan and Piper. When I'm like two or three years old, like that type of type of time and i like i remember like watching wrestling as a as a kid with like my parents and my dad would like make fun of my mom that she liked ravishing rick rude even though she was like she would like no he's disgusting it's like no you love him and stuff <laughs> um but then i did, like i fell out of wrestling from like then on and then it wasn't until i tell the story because it's it, it, i think it like encapsulates wrestling a little bit it wasn't until i was flipping around on tv and i landed on monday night raw on the lead up to uh, WrestleMania 11. And I stopped because I saw Lawrence Taylor. And Lawrence Taylor was a big NFL player. I'd followed NFL as a kid and stuff. And I saw this giant tattoo headed bald man push him. And I stopped the channel. I said, who's pushing Lawrence Taylor? And I just slowly fell into wrestling after that. It was like, then it became, you know, Shawn Michaels came out and Diesel came out. And then all of a sudden I'm up late one night and ECW is on TV and I see Shane Douglas for the first time. Like it just morphed from that moment. And I was when I tell that story, I, I like I do tell it to like trainees and stuff because I, I always say like when people complain about Raw or they complain about wrestling today and they go, why are those celebrities on TV? I stopped because there was a celebrity on TV and it's now. Uh, well, how old am I? So it was. 23 well, that years was, ago yeah, that was wrestlemania 11 right? 23 years yeah. ago or something mm-hmm. and i'm still watching professional wrestling today because lawrence taylor got pushed by bam bam bigelow because right, it's, it's a gateway for somebody to yeah. go into it some ronda rousey fan checked out wrestlemania because of ronda rousey right yeah absolutely and people don't realize that those types of moments uh will and can encapsulate someone forever it has for me i mm-hmm. i've i I've watched, I mean, there's dips and dives. You go through moments where you're like, I didn't watch, I like people go like, oh, you remember that feud? And like, I didn't watch that. I was, I was doing something else. I was probably dating a girl who didn't like wrestling or something. <laughs> you know, things like that. Everybody's had their time off, I think, at yeah, some point, right? absolutely. But like, so I, I always, that's like a moment to me 
that means so much. And and it's weird to think about that match because it's like it's considered like it was considered at the time like man this was terrible. And now like everyone looks back and is like it actually wasn't too bad. Like Van Man Bigelow Lawrence Taylor isn't actually that bad of a match if you rewatch it. Right, right. Like kind of like you, you look back and you're like. Eh. Um, I have the same thought about Halloween Havoc I went back and watched. Which one were you watching? <laughs> oh, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> uh, we just like we just rewatched a bunch of Halloween Havocs uh, I, yeah, at my house. Yeah, because it's Halloween. That's what you do yeah, now, right? Yeah, you, you can. Because we were drinking and watching Halloween Havoc for like hours. Yeah, it was some Chamber of Horrors. I never actually yeah. watched the Chamber of Horrors match. Oh, I got real drunk and watched that. Oh, you kind of need to, right? Yeah. But man, the crowd was into it. Yeah, that's, they really were. Chattanooga loved that match. And the weird thing about that match is you like while you're watching it the entire time you're going like man they're really into it and then you're like man this is really weird and then you go like man why is the diamond stud in there like he doesn't fit it at all like it's, oh yeah so it's random. all like creepy people and then scott hall and you're yeah. like what is scott hall doing here exactly um but anyways uh <laughs> that aside there's yeah. some good matches in halloween havoc by the yeah, way yeah, just there's... just go go there is actually go look through um, some guy that looks like Rick Rude. Or just to bring oh, the Phantom. <laughs> Phantom. I'm yeah, just like, man. what the hell is Halloween Phantom? <laughs> and why does he kind of look like Rick Rude? Man, Bischoff was pushing that all night, too. Oh, jeez. But anyways, back to it. Um, so what made you jump from uh, you know being a fan of wrestling to getting into wrestling? Now, I know you as a manager, yeah. and, and you work a lot with behind the scenes and mm-hmm. everything. Um, but I, I think I, you, you also have done you know, like full wrestling training, too, right? Yeah, so... Um, Whenever, so, all right, how do I start this? There is it's okay, a, we'll fix it in post. Yeah, so there was a Just moment. Just like my voice. Um, for people that don't know, um, Jack Pollock and I are like real life best friends. We've been friends. We've known each other since we were, you know, in high school together. We've known each other since like 16, 17, 18 It's old. the beards, isn't it? It's, <laughs> we didn't have them back then, obviously. But, uh, it's the aspirational beards, wasn't it? <laughs> It was. And so like, well, actually when we first met each other, we hated each other. And then like friendship grew out of that. But anyway, he, um, you know, he, if you've watched his show and you should watch it, he tells his story about going to Calgary. So, you know, Pollock leaves Pittsburgh and goes to Calgary and I'm just kind of sitting on my own going like, man, my friend's going to go achieve his dream. Isn't that awesome? Like kind of moment. Mm -hmm. So he comes back and I decide like, well, I'm going to go support my friend because that's what a good friend does. So as he was heading to different shows to try and get booked, I just rode around with him uh, and would hang out at the shows Um, because I like wrestling, you know. So I would show up early and go set up and tear down rings for everyone um, as just like, uh, hey, man, if I set up and tear down, they'll let me in for free and I can hang around with my friend. It's just like a support. So he has someone in the car riding with him and going through stuff. So Pollock and I, like for while he was trying to get booked, I just kind of like hung out and like set up rings and did you know tear down stuff like that which i always liked um because i come i come from a theater background where like i did set crew all the time it's like that's Mm -hmm. not a big deal so after a while you're hanging around enough people start going like hey man can you hold a camera and film my match yeah sure i'm not doing anything i'll film your match and then it's like oh man you you know how to film yeah yeah you know i did theater i did you know video, video stuff so yeah i know how to film and then it was you know, oh, you did theater. Do you know how to talk? It's like, oh, yeah, and I, I know how to talk. And then, like, all of a sudden, everyone's like, well, why aren't you doing this? And you turn around and go, like, why am, why am I not doing this? So um, I talked to uh, BC Steel, uh, and, and Ben was, like, the premier manager at the time and probably still is. We'll give him credit. Um, we'll give him some no, credit. he'll be on Tuesday. I'll be hearing it. <laughs> he'll get some credit. So I talked to him, and, he, and I said, well, how did you break in? Like, how did you break in the business? He goes, I trained to be a referee. I mm-hmm. said, okay, great. That, that's how I'll break in. So I went down to uh, PWX uh, where Crusher Hansen was training with um, Scotty Gash and paid my money and said, I want to be a referee. And they said, okay. So I went through um, about three to four months of training, um, learned how to bump, learned how to run the ropes, learned, you know, learned everything I needed to learn to be a referee. Um, and then started just refereeing matches and did that for a little bit. But then all of a sudden people, I started doing like podcasting and stuff like that. And people go like, Oh, you can talk, you can talk. So then it was, well, why don't you be an interviewer? And why don't you do commentary? I was like, okay, great. I'll do that. And then all of a sudden after a couple of months, they're like, okay, well you can cut promos and you can do that. And then all of a sudden I'm managing and it's just like, it just slid right into it. So like legit, I refereed for maybe three months. <laughs> 
<laughs> like no time at all. I think I haven't refereed in a long time. I used to go referee training matches cause they were fun, but I haven't refereed in forever because Jeez. it's just, yeah, I've been, it just happened all of a sudden, like all of a sudden you get a mic in your hand, you go like, Oh, I'm not going to let go of this. Like, I'm just going to do this now. And so like start doing, start managing, um, jumping in cars, managing everyone I could trying to do everything I could to like, you know, be in the wrestling business. And then, you know, one day you look around and you go like, holy shit, like uh, last week was six years that I've been doing this. So it just, it comes out of nowhere at you pretty fast. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the less painful way of getting into wrestling too. It is. Um, I always tell people like, I took the easy route because like, mm. I don't, I don't bump much because um, as far as managers concerned, I don't think managers should bump that much. I think you should save them for big moments and mm. like really like make them work. But the ones I do take, like they suck because you're not used to them. Mm. So like when you take um, like Duke Davis uh, choke slam me like four times at one like one point, Ooh, like one point. in a row. Yeah, in a Ooh. row. And it's just like you. I had the the best part about that is like the night before I got talked into a show. They're like, "Hey man, go down to Black Diamond and work." I was like, "Yeah, all right." Spot show for Black Diamond. They're always like a ton of fun to do. And so I was managing. I think Ty Cross. And they were like, all right, well, the, you guys are the end of the show. And then Keith Hot was going to, like, give you the splash. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've taken the splash from Keith. It sucks, but I'll take it. I love Keith. Keith gives me a splash, like, legit on my dick. Like, lands right on it. And my hip pops out of place. And I can't walk, basically. And I'm stretching out, and I'm, like, stumbling around. I'm like, man, I got to go take four choke slams from Duke Davis tomorrow. Like the next day I get there, my back's feeling fine. The first one hits and then like everything pops back into place. <laughs> like I'm fine. And like Duke's not bad. He's not a bad choke slammer. He's, mm-hmm. he's pretty, he's pretty good with what he does. Um, but like, I just did remix and I fell off a ladder cause I'm an idiot and stuff like that. Like you do, uh, I just, I've, I've dislocated my shoulder a couple times on dumb stuff. It's always my fault. It's mm-hmm. never anyone else's fault. I wouldn't put that out there. I'm the idiot that does dumb stuff that I, I go like, man, it'd be cool if, and you're like, dude, what are you doing? Like, it's not going to be that cool. So I've like, yeah, I've dislocated both shoulders doing dumb stuff. Jeez. Yeah. So, so, so. Only yeah. one concussion. <laughs> Only one. That's not bad. That's great. <laughs> so, so you're the hardest hitted manager. <laughs> I, ben always jokes because BC came in and, um, when I came in, Ben's back was like real messed up. And he was like, I'm not going to bump anymore. And then like, I come in right behind him. He's like, he'll take all the bumps. I was like, yeah, why not? And then all of a sudden I'm like, now I'm like 33 and I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm not bumping. Anymore. <laughs> I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. Like we're going to save it for one. So you've been managing all this time. Um, yeah. You know, what is kind of, because I, I, I know for me, you know, watching indies like, you know, 10 years ago, there's always like, it seems like there's the, hey, whose friend got to manage out there? Yeah. That seems to have no business out there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how do you kind of uh, uh, keep that that bar kind of raised on the indies? Oh, man, you have no idea how much that bothers me. <laughs> it really does. Like, it feels like Ring of Honor was that way for a while. It, it like, man, because, like, and I don't want to say, and I, and I will be completely honest, because you, you heard how I went through my early years, which was, like, I set up right. rings here or there. And then like the luxury of training at PWX was like, you didn't have to do set up and tear down because they had their own ring mm-hmm. like set up. So like there was a luxury there. And I always say like, I didn't pay nearly enough dues. I did not pay nearly enough for the position that I've been granted in my life. Um, but you have no idea how many, how many times I've gotten in a car with people and driven to a place and managed and like came back soaking wet sweating because i worked so hard out there for them to go like yeah man you're really good but um this guy over here works for free and he's the promoter's friend so he's there he's gonna be our top heel manager here wow so we don't need you and you go like that's garbage uh so i it's been a huge frustration for me and at one point I had long conversations about like, we need to elevate the art form. Uh, I have to be like better than everyone else. Like I have to be so good to make people think that managers are okay. I have dozens of stories of guys where I would be at a show um, managing someone. And one of the rest, like one of the guys would come over to the guy I'm managing and go, 
Does he know what he's doing? Is he, is he okay? Will he be there? And then you get like, you know, whoever I'm managing, like, yeah, he's fine. He's going to be fine. He won't miss a spot. Like, you'll be good. But there is like a default with wrestlers that the manager is an idiot. But they it's, probably experienced so many of them. Agreed. Right? Yeah. They've experienced so much of it that this is just a trigger for wrestlers now of this person doesn't, they're, you know, somebody's friend, they're somebody's girlfriend, they're somebody's brother who just wants, or some, uh, you know, local DJ who gives them free advertising or something, and they don't know what they're doing. They've never been trained. They don't know where to be. And for me, it, it was a point of emphasis to not screw up because it, it made us all look bad if I did. And it like was so stressful for a time. Mm -hmm. I remember um, the first time I managed against Gory, like he hands me like six missed packets of like, cause it's, it's a huge match. And he was like, these are all the spots. Don't fuck it up. And you're like, okay. Like, and he's like, well, where are you going to be? Where are you going to be for this one? Where are you going to be for that one? And it's just like, finally I tell him like, I'll find you you'll be, we'll be fine. And then once you do it and you're fine, like I have a stress forever now. Like yeah. we've done enough together that Glory trusts me. Like if he hands me someone and says, says, this is where I need you to be. I'll be there. Like you ha it's so hard to just walk into any new locker room and immediately assume that everyone thinks you're an idiot. It's, it's one of the hardest things that, like I've had to deal with. And it's so stressful that like, you feel like you have to work a thousand times harder or people are going to be like, who is this guy? And why is he here? And why are we paying him? Like, why are we giving this guy any money? Um, I tell anyone, because I have people all the time ask me, like, well, how do I be a manager? And I go, you got to be at least, at the worst, the third best talker on any roster. Because if you're not, they don't need you. Well, that's the other thing, too, because, I mean, the manager, I know, you know, we always talk about, you know, uh, you know, uh, the state of the managers on, on you know, say, mm -hmm. WWE and thing on the other shows. Um, you know, what is the point of being a manager? You know, usually to help somebody that needs a talker or yeah. uh, uh, something out there or, you know, a heel or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Like, what do you kind of see that position as a manager, uh, especially on these indie shows? So on the indie shows, I think it's way more important to have managers. I think WWE level, if you're making it to the WWE level and you're not... You have, um, you have all the tools. You have all the tools, yeah. especially now when these guys were... Um, so many of the guys that are on the roster today that came through their developmental had promo coaching every day with Dusty Rhodes. At mm. this point, you should be okay to do your own thing. Right. You don't, the state of WWE and they go, why don't they use managers? It's like they, they've, they're pretty good. Like the wrestlers at this point should be okay. You do have the random, like uh, Roman Reigns of the world who aren't as good at promos as people would want them to be. Um, but, and I think he's tied to a, how held to a weird standard and that's a different discussion for another day. Um, but on the Indies, it's really, really important because, um, there's a lot of guys that are just learning it, especially green guys or newer guys. They don't understand, um, a lot of people like crafting a promo is the exact same thing as crafting a match in that there's an there's a beginning middle and end there's a, a shine a, a heat there's the, like it's the same kind of crafting as you craft a promo and guys don't understand that until i mean you have to cut a lot of them to really get it. the same way guys don't really understand wrestling until they've had you know 100 matches then they go like okay i'm starting to get this it's the same with promos you got to cut like 100 of them before you really go like oh, okay this is this is how they work right. um so on the indies to me i think that it's incredibly important and like for example like um when I started managing Pollock, um, who is a, is a really good example, um, he was not one of the best promos on, on the roster. He just hadn't had time to really do them. Um, no one was giving him a microphone and be like, you've got to cut promos, you've got to cut promos. So he had turned heel and, um, you know, they put me with him and they were like, well, you know, maybe you can help him. And so we developed and we're I mean, well, obviously we have a chemistry, but we developed, you know, a kind of thing where it was like, OK, I'll cut 80% of this promo, you cut 20. And you kind of figure out that 20. Okay, cool, he's got that. And then it got to a point where it was like 50-50. I'll cut 50, you cut 50. And now it's at the point where we'll look at each other and I go, do you want to start or finish? we will go, uh, maybe I want to start. And I go, okay, then I'll finish. And then from there, it's just we feed off each other. We can work back and forth. And so the development for him, having that, if I get frustrated or I lose myself in a promo, I can just crutch right in and take it from him. 
helped him in a lot to find the character, find his way. Um, I give the same credit to, um, I worked a lot with Ty Cross down at Black Diamond, and he started to develop a character out of that. Uh, Edric Everhart's another guy who, um, it's so much easier when you can turn around and go like, hey man, I'm lost. And I can just, I can feel it and I know it and I can go, that you now know next time, oh, okay, this is how I got lost. And it's, it's, it's an experience level thing. I love working with guys like that. I, I would rather work with guys like that. Like being in the main event, and this just sounds weird to people that aren't following wrestling, being in the main event's boring because it's about the title and it's boring and there's no like creative juice. The fun part is working with guys that are trying to find a character, working on things that you're trying to. Kind of that development, right? The development's so much fun. I, I had more fun doing that. I would manage, um, I would manage a thousand guys like uh, Ethan Wright or Tony Johnson who are guys that are like, man, I just need to find it. And they're driven to find, like, what is am I missing? What am I doing? Then, like, Pollock and I are friends and it's fun to manage him, but, like, he's got it. He's fine. He doesn't need me. Like, he's got it. <laughs> it's really funny because now he has um, Argos, who is, like, the same. Like, Argos is basically a manager. Like, if you look at him. Like, oh, yeah. He does. He's, and so, like, he doesn't need me at all anymore. It's really funny because, like, when I see him in those moments that I would take over, there's Argos to like take over. And it's like, okay, you're cool, man. You got it. Like you got a cool little thing going now. He is like, even, even when like it's Argos's match, he's still Jack Pollock's hype man. Yeah. It seems, <laughs> yeah. which is fascinating. to it, watch. it really is. And I like the first time I saw the three of them together, um, uh, it was an IWC show and I saw RC Pollock and Argos and I looked and I went, Oh my God, it's me, him and Peyton again. Because like RC's kind of the little more quiet one, and Peyton was always the more quiet one in the group, mm -hmm. and it was like, oh my god, we're just doing they're just doing the same thing, and it just like floats so easily for Paul. He was just like, oh, okay, yeah, here we go. Like I know what I'm doing. Like it didn't change at all, which is beautiful. They they've done a great job. Mm -hmm. um, they become really good. RC's become a really good friend too. That dude's that dude's like he's smarter than people think he is. Like he's way smarter about wrestling than people think he is. So real good crew, and we oh would, yeah. We would. And you can check those out in past interviews here on Indie yeah. Night Show, including the latest Argos takeover. This is this is where I this is where I just promote the rest of your shows. Okay, I see. <laughs> oh, this, this is perfect. This is great. Then I don't have to. Exactly. Uh, so uh, from that, uh, talking to manager, I, I know you work uh, on 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 the uh, behind the scenes on a lot of promotions and have over the years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, can you talk about getting involved in in, in that aspect of it? Yeah, it kind of like came weirdly to me. Um, because they said I come I come from a, a theater background before. Yeah. So like all through high school, uh, I, I I did everything that you could do in a theater production, which means I I acted, I sang, I did makeup, I did stage crew, I stage managed, I directed, I wrote shows, I wrote three shows for my high school. Um, I've done di dinner theater, I've done Shakespeare, I've done anything you can imagine in a theater production outside of playing in the pit. I've done it. And so when I got into wrestling, I have this theater background. And so like, you know, I just start talking to guys of like, hey, man, when you um, do your promos, make sure you watch your diction, you know, because you're losing consonants here and there. And I can't really hear your words. So like watch your diction on this. And here's a couple exercises for you to get your diction down. And people just start like noticing that type of stuff. And like because I come from a creative writing background, there's like a little bit of story elements where I'd be like, hey, man, like where's your character going on this or why is this happening? And like all of a sudden people start taking notice of that. So like I became like for a lot of young guys, cause I would go to training a lot, like a de facto, like, Hey man, how do I pitch this story? Cause I was getting stories. Like I was pitching stories constantly to everyone and they were getting done. And people were like, well, how are you getting it done? It's like, Oh, okay. Well, this is how you pitch a story. Like mm -hmm. you got to pitch a story the right way. So like my, before I even started training, it was the night I showed up and paid my money to train. I was a PWX. Quinn was down there to take my money and I gave him the money and I said, and he goes, yeah. And then Peyton was down there too. And Peyton goes, Hey man, he's got an idea for a story by the way for me. And I pitched a story before I'd even like started training. So like I was, I, and like, don't do that if you're going to train. That's like the stupidest thing you can do. And the weird thing is, it's like, they did it. Like they got, they actually did the story. And I was like, this is weird. Like that. I don't, this is like, so like I, I kind of had a knack for it. And then I did a injury angle for a while where I was off shows. And so I was just hanging out at shows and guys would ask me like, Hey man, does this sequence make sense? Like psychologically. And you'd be like, ah, no. Like, why are you doing that? And then we'd break that down. And then that was about the time that I was like, 
Pollock and Brandon K were feuding. And so I was talking to Brandon all the time. And then that's when Brandon started asking me of like, because Brandon's been having the idea to run a promotion of his own for a while, which became Rise. And that's when he started asking me like, okay, like, are you really interested in being a part of creative? And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm really passionate about is being a part of creative. So he eventually, that's how I kind of started getting tapped is through like, he was noticing of like, okay, this guy. So he would give me stuff and be like, Hey man, this is where things are going. How would you do it? And I'd be like, Oh, this is what I would do. And he'd be like, man, that's how I would do it. Like, so like we started to like jive on the same page. And then from there, once he started rise, I started just slowly helping out here or there of mm-hmm. like, Hey man, maybe these guys are good or you should book these guys or um, you know, if you're going this way, this is what I would do. And then finally he was like, you need to just come regularly and be a part of creative for us. So, um, the last couple of months I've been working with creative for him. Um, we have a really good creative team and I, I couldn't be happier with the creative cause we have, it's me, um, Jake Garrett, who is uh, just a wealth of knowledge as far as booking is concerned. The guy knows the ins and outs of every, every scenario that you could think of and um shirley doe um who doe has been a mentor to me since day one i peppered him with a million questions and he's always answered and so to work with those two guys and to learn from them has been like i remember as a kid watching shirley doe and jake garrett wrestle and now like i'm talking to them about creative ideas and they're like oh yeah that's a really good idea we should do that and you're like okay this is like this is cool to me like, that's kind of like, I'm not a fan of like fanboying and like, they're my friends, but at the same time, it's like, Shirley Doe is the guy who booked IWC and it's like, when they were bringing in AJ Styles and CM Punk and Chris Daniels and Chris Sabin and Samoa Joe and like all of that stuff, like the heyday of me, like as a kid watching IWC, it was like Shirley Doe, the guy who trained like, you know, Gory and Facade and DJ Z and like the list just goes on and then you're like sitting there talking about SNL and stuff. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. Like, he's, he's <laughs> or or how much he hates impact. Oh yeah. Doe is, um, I tell every young kid, if you like, Doe is Pittsburgh's Pat Patterson. If you don't understand Jeez. what you, if you don't understand what you have yeah. with that mind hanging around, yeah. then I, I have been backstage where Doe's come up to people to age in a match. Like, and been like, Hey man, do you guys need anything? And they're like, nah, we're good. And I'm like, man, what are you doing? Like, you just have this untapped pool of knowledge that's that wants to help you, who chose you to come agent for you, and you're gonna brush him off, man. I don't. I I like. There's a few guys that I know that talk to him like every day, and like they're all better. They're all better wrestlers from talking to him. Like I know, I know Connor does. Connor started talking to him and just became like just head and shoulders above as soon as he did. Duke Davis is another one. Started talking to him all the time, and then just boom, transition to like one of the smartest wrestling models. like it's it's stupid not to to take advantage of these things so that's i mean for me um i would sit at shows and i would sit by guys like jake or doe or i'd go to the bar and talk to jake or doe and just ask them questions or just go like what did you like and what didn't you like well i didn't like this well why and then you find out why and you just learn like that's that's for me uh that's what I wanted to do. I think like looking back, I was like, man, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. I was like, man, I want to manage. And then you're like, nah, like now looking back, it's like, that's not what you wanted to do. Like you were trying to do this. So it was, it was the thing that got you to this. I think so. Um, and, and, and I have like, as you've talked about, like, and Connor and I talk on, cause I used to do Connor's podcast like all the time. Cause I lived, I used to live like legit five minute walk from him. And so I would just, he'd be like, I need a guest. I'm like, God, oh, cool, man. I, I'm hung over. Let's do a podcast. Uh, so we would talk about weird stuff and I have like really wonky views, uh, <laughs> on storytelling and wrestling and character and stuff like that. And then like when, and a lot of it comes from guys like Jake and Doe, cause they have really wonky views too of like, man, don't listen to, don't just do the normal stuff, find something different, find something creative, find a way to be different. And that's always like stuck with me, um, is, uh, like one of the weird things uh, I do is. If you ever see me manage, I tend to not wear the same clothes. So I always wear like a different dress shirt and a different tie or a different hat or something like that because I feel like in real life, you don't see the per- people wearing the same clothes all the time. Like Doug wears the same outfit all the time. 
Right. You know what I mean? Like TV characters wear the same clothes all the time. Bart Simpson has worn the same uh, shorts and shirt for his entire life. Real people change clothes. So why would I wear like the same shirt tie combo to every show? Like colors should be different. Clothes should be different. How do you stand out? How is how do you look different? Um, I've I've uh, tried a million different things, different looks. Um, sometimes like sometimes it's the full suit. Sometimes it's just a vest. Um, I would manage like four different guys on a show, and every match I'd be wearing something different. So you're the costume change guy. Yeah, <laughs> and people would notice. Yeah. Um, I use like one of my big things is I'm not wearing it today because I came from work, but I, Chuck Taylors were like one of my big things I always wore, and because it was a splash of color. Like you could wear like different colored chucks and be cool. So, and Jake gave me the, uh, Jake gave me the idea. He goes, um, so I had these yellow ones to wear with Pollock because I had like blue stuff and I wear like these bright yellow chucks. And he goes, you should never wear those unless you manage a champion. So like I only wear the gold Chuck Taylors when I manage a champion. So like legit on shows, I'd have to run back and change shoes. <laughs> Because I'm like, oh, I'll wear the red ones for the first match and then blue ones for the second match. And then the title match is like the main event. So I go change like three pairs of shoes and I have to carry all this in my bag because I'm like a crazy person. Like, I don't know why I'm doing all this. But like, I don't know if anyone notices, but I notice and like, I think it's cool. Like, if I was a fan, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's awesome. <laughs> well, at this point. Yeah. Um, what are you watching these days? What's got your attention? Are there any wrestlers out there that got your attention? Um... So ever since I took over like creative, it's been harder and harder to watch like wrestling. I like want to watch because yeah. like your inbox is full of YouTube videos of people like, Hey man, uh, someone sent me your Facebook info or they sent it to like the rise Facebook or Twitter or something. And they're like, Hey man, like, can you watch my match? And like, uh, I feel like the in, in, thing to do with integrity is to actually watch stuff before I go like, yeah, no, it was good. So, or no, we're not, you know, I watch it. So like, there's a lot of watching of that stuff, but, um, I try to keep up with current product. I really wish I watched more NXT. I just don't have the time. Um, I'm also one of those weird people that watches like, I have so many things on my list of books and, and TV and movies and stuff. So like wrestling will sometimes get buried because it's like, yeah, I don't need to catch SmackDown this week or I don't need to watch this. But if I'm watching, um, nationally, I'll always stop for John Cena. I, I, the you if there if John Cena is on TV, I will stop and watch him. Um, I still think John Cena is the best promo today, and I still think he's the best match today. Mm -hmm. um, I've had arguments when very very drunk that John Cena may be the best ever, like best ever. Wow. Yeah, I that stopped. would be fighting words in yeah. some bar. Yeah. <laughs> I've had those conversations when I'm real drunk, where I'm like, you know what? No, John Cena is better than everyone ever. Like it's like that that kind of love of John Cena sometimes AJ Styles I'll, I'll always watch AJ um mm -hmm. legit like bell in bell out the guy's phenomenal like it's not just a moniker that he's been using since he was what like 18 like the dude is really great to watch um NXT like if I can I try to always catch Chris Hero um I got to meet Chris barely and he was one of the nicest people I've ever watched like and met and just I love watching Hero stuff um Ring of Honor, I'll watch here or there, but usually I only watch Shane Taylor. Uh, I got to work with Shane a little bit, and like, dude's just, he's awesome. Like, he's just legit awesome. Uh, and Ray Rowe, who I got, to, I got to manage Ray Rowe once, um, and I always joke, um, it's the closest I'll ever come to managing Brock Lesnar. That dude is a freak. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Ray's another guy I'll watch. Like, I'll watch War Machine, I'll watch Shane. Um, locally, um, it's just like when, like when I talk locally, like this is just the, uh, Marcus man puts over his friends portion of the show. I'm sure. <laughs> um, like, especially at rise now, because I've gotten an opportunity to be on the creative end and, and that type of thing. And these people aren't just my friends anymore. Um, but I will say this, um, uh, Matt Connard is a guy that for some reason, everyone has slept on for far too long i i don't get why people why no one has snatched this dude up and been like this guy like he is he's so good in the ring his presence is really really good he's got a really marketable gimmick and he's phenomenal um no drama nothing with him at the same time um 
there's a lot of young talent coming up that's so good right now. Um, Lee Moriarty is like legit a top prospect. Like he's a legit blue chip prospect. Um, uh, and I'll put him over. Uh, just recently got to see him again, and man, did he improve. Derek Direction is another. Like that dude's really good. Um, I don't think people realize how good Derek got. Um, he like Derek didn't get a real fair shake in anywhere in Pittsburgh for a while. Like it just like didn't work out for Derek for some reason, and I'm not really sure. But uh, he came back in and just did our rise show on the 28th with Lee, and just like I mean, just a banger, dude. Just a really great match. I think I heard. I've been hearing great things about him up in uh, PCW in Cleveland as well. Yeah, he's been doing a lot up for PCW. I like to call it Jodo Pro. Uh, for for Jodo Pro. Jodo Pro. Jodo Brasky. Um, he's also been working up in AAW, um, doing like the what's it called, um, the production. It's like him, Frankie Flynn, and um, CK Magnum. They yeah. do a little gimmick up there. So Derek's been getting like Derek's really good. Um. Uh, I'm trying to think who else right now. Oh, we, you know what? I'll just put him over. We just had him bring in. He's from AIW as well. Is um, Dr. Daniel C. Rockingham. This dude is one of the best gimmicks I've seen. We just brought him in. I saw him at Mega, and then he did some remix shows. Um, Dr. Dan is a really great character, really great worker. Um, Christian Black, who, who I've mentioned before, that dude is just... I've, I, I remember when he was... Uh, first kind of starting out and like he would do like 90 things wrong and people would like chew him out of like, man, why weren't you here? And this looked like crap. And like, what are you doing? But every time I saw him, I'd watch that game. Like, man, can he bump? Like he bumped like Shawn Michaels, man. Like this kid could bump. And so I come up to him and be like, just keep making people look good. And eventually like this him. Is this Dr. Dan? Yeah, that's Dr. Dan. <laughs> Dr. Dan is awesome. You know, found a match of him uh, fighting the uh, the man scout. Yeah. <laughs> uh, put over Dr. Dan right now. Like, he was just on our show and just, like, phenomenal. He does a whole uh, motivational speaker gimmick. Nice. And he's really good. Um, so I was talking, like, Christian Black's another guy. Like, he makes people look great. Um, he bumps for everyone. He makes people look good. Um, he had a really breakout match at the Stomp Out for Cancer show with um, De Niro, Pollock, and Duke Davis. And he, like, when you saw the card, you looked at him and he went, like, man, what's this kid doing in here? Like, he doesn't belong. And then he made everyone look like a million dollars. And I people were backstage being like, he's got to be hurt. He's not okay. And he walks back fine. Like, he made everyone look great. Um, he's a legit dude. There's a lot of kids coming up in IWC, too, that, like, um, and, like, IWC is like real weird right now because I've been going to a lot of shows, just hanging out, like doing stuff. I did some commentary br- briefly with Dombrowski because he was like, please. I was like, all right. Um, but like they have like this really stacked top of their card. And then they bring in like, you know, DJ Z and, you know, Shane was there and Shane Douglas and these types of names that kind of like push everyone down a little bit in the mid card. But they got like like Calvin Couture. I'll put over that kid. He's got a great gimmick, immediately recognizable, funny. Um, Jamie Jameson. That kid's like he's gonna he's gonna find his way. We always joke Jamie Jameson is like the prototypical um, like mid '90s ECW guy. Like when you look at him, you're like, man, Paul Heyman would make a million dollars with you. Just like the way he looks, everything. That kid's really putting it together. Um, I have yet to have a bad conversation with Jinx. That girl is smart. That's Jamie James. Look at that dude, man. He looks like almost like um like he looks like a Spicoli almost. Like he's got that weird ECW vibe to him. Um, he's really great. Um, I like I said, I've had you have to have a bad conversation with Jinx, one of the nicest people I've ever met. Smart. She deserves a little bit of a, a, a you know, a rub there. She's really, really good. Um I'm trying to think of anyone else in IWC that's like another Keith Hot, man. Keith freaking hot. I uh, this uh, you you don't say this name, but Keith Hot is like almost he's Dusty Rhodesian man. He like people connect with Keith Hot in a way that um, I've never seen before. People in the crowd look at Keith Hot and just I mean they love him. Um, Remy Levay is another one. Remy's a, like you see Remy Levay like as a guy and you go yeah there's Keith and Remy. Like you see Remy Levay and you go like man he's cool. I want to be his friend like. What's he all about? Like he's just got a look about him that's like so cool and so interesting. Um, they've had a really great run. 
um, of like really good talent there. And then like I'll put over like a couple kids in Ohio too. Like um, man, hopefully he's coming in soon. We're ta- I, I've been talking to him, but um, if you guys haven't seen Jackson Stone yet, uh, this dude is legit. Um, comes out from out of Michigan. Um, he's he is. I met him, man, maybe a year ago. And I was like infatuated with the dude just because he's so smart and he's big and he's good. Uh, he goes by the the Suplex Shogun. He does a lot for Dombrowski up in Cleveland right now. Some stuff at Mega. Um, another legit prospect, dude. Like top prospect kind of a guy. Um, if you're sleeping on those types of guys, like I like that, like he so smart, so good. Um, of course, like. Duke and Gannon, man. That's going to be a tag team in the future. Um, they could feud with anyone. Um, love those two guys. And then, uh, obviously, it's like, I've managed System Elite, like, everywhere. And, like, another team of, like, man, how come they didn't get their shot, man? Like, who's holding these guys back? Like, and, and from everything I hear, incredible in singles guys, too. Uh, Edric is, like, him and Pollock are wrestling down a Black Diamond on... November 5th and that's a match that you're they've never wrestled singles before they wrestled tag never wrestled singles before that match is going to be a banger dude like it's going to be really good um and if you're like that's one of those matches where you go like man you got to be there because like where else are you going to see it like you're not going to see those guys wrestle anywhere else um and then Ty has improved so much character like he's always like ty's always been solid in the ring man this is a kid that like he would just kill it in the ring like always where he needed to be moves look crisp everything is good and then it was like you got to put the character together like where is that and then the last like two to three years of just straight character development he's 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 worth the money now and as a tag team they're awesome like they're fun um they're really goofy um and like yeah they're my friends so of course i'm gonna like talk nice about them um you know black ant society forever my friends (laughs) awesome (laughs) what is the best and worst thing about uh indie wrestling for you so far best and worst um the best is i have made some of the best friends that i didn't know i needed in my life um i'm a very private person um in my life um if you go on like my facebook page like there's no information about my real life in there (laughs) like it's all like i'm a real private person i don't i don't let a lot of people in and when i got into indie wrestling i had two like real friends like i have a lot of friends that live out of town that like left after college and stuff but i had like two real friends which was my girlfriend and pollock and that was it and now I have this menagerie of people that if I tomorrow needed to move out of my house, they would give me money for a security deposit. You know, like really, really great friends who um, I don't have a I don't have a car. Um, I don't have a driver's license. I have friends that ship me all over the place with, without a question. Um, some of the best people in the world that I've ever met. And it's weird to think about that in wrestling because like people are like, oh, you know, the wrestlers, but like legit some of the best people I've ever met in my life. I didn't know I needed those people in my life until you, they're in your life and you're like, I don't know how I got by, like by myself for so long. They're amazing people. The worst part about it is uh, you get really, really close to those people and you become really, really good friends with those people. Um, if any of them break your heart, it's the hardest thing to deal with. Um, if some stupid wrestling reason ruins it, it, it's the worst possible thing in the world. Because like, I have tried to maintain very little drama in my wrestling career, and that's very hard to do in professional wrestling. <laughs> um, and when any sort of drama comes up and you lose those types of friendships, it's just it's really dumb. It's really really dumb. Um, so like. I have tried to stay out of politics as much as possible. I've tried to just be me. And like, if you don't, if you don't like my idea, 
you should tell me. And I'm cool with it, man. Like if you say like, man, that's a bad idea. It's like, cool, let's move on. Like, I don't care. Like I come from, I come from theater where we pitched ideas and like you would do improv troops. You'd be like, oh, this or that. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Like move on. Um, but there's a lot of pettiness and stupidity that I, uh, like every day I go through my phone to people that like, I don't talk to anymore. And you go like, man, why aren't we talking anymore? Like, what's this about? Like, this is stupid, but you can't, like, you can't fix it because it's stupid and they're not going to fix it. And it's like, ah, whatever. I'd say that's the worst part about it is you can get real close and then like you're done. And there's like a few that like left wrestling that I'll still text because like, no, no, this was a real friendship. So like, um, I still text Jimmy nuts every once in a while. Like Jimmy's a really good dude. Um, he left wrestling and he's happier for it. And that's awesome. Like it's good for him. I was just texting Joe Brooks the other day. Um, Brian Bowers is another guy. I'll just talk like Bowers. And I will talk like NBA basketball and stuff. Like they're little things that keep you from talking to people and wrestling is the stupidest. So like my advice to everyone is if you can bury a hatchet, you should bury it immediately. It just feels better. It's just dumb. And I have like probably a thousand hatchets to see Perry. <laughs> but you should. I mean, it's just dumb to keep those things locked up for too long. So generally, you're involved with the uh, uh, Rise Wrestling these days? Yeah, man. That's like my number one thing that has taken over my life. <laughs> so where can people find out everything that's coming up with them? So check out uh, RiseWrestling.com. It's Rise with a Y. Um, and the Facebook page has a lot of good information on there. We're trying to bump the social media as- aspect up. Uh, uh, Rise uh, underscore wrestling is the, the Twitter handle as well. Um, and then our Instagram, uh, it's the uh, same thing. Um, you can check it all on the website. It gives you um, kind of update information, um, our type of stuff. Um, it'll give you all the social media to keep us followed because there's always stuff we're posting. We're trying to get out more match graphics and promos and everything like that. Everyone's like... Man, we got a locker room that's working their ass off, dude. They're working so hard for us. Um, everyone in that locker room cut promos or they're pushing it out or they're sharing content. And these guys are all working their ass off for us. Um, and it's it, it's really, really encouraging when you see it. It's really cool. Uh, Rise is definitely kind of on the ground floor or something here. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like you guys are really kind of setting up and, and learn from other you know things other people are doing. Uh, to kind of you know, you know blow that thing up down there and in the area that doesn't have wrestling right now yeah, otherwise yeah it, so. i mean that that area used to be a hotbed mm-hmm. uh for wrestling for a while um and that's brandon's hometown is down there so like i mean he knows it in and out and so um it's been slow going uh we're like we're coming up on a year in december i mean i've only been really involved for maybe like three months um i was involved real early on and then like took a step back because it was like uh, maybe I want to leave wrestling and I don't know if I want to do this. Um, and then brought back Brandon really brought me back into it. Um, slowly, but surely, um, every time I see it, uh, we kind of like Brandon and I talk about it. We want to build something, but we want to do it the right way more than anything else. Um, and that means, um, we're going to build the shows around the right talent. We're going to build the shows in the right way. We're going to build the shows without drama. We're going to build the shows with integrity and do it the right way. Um, and I couldn't have a better partner than Brandon Kay, who's one of the most easily one of the most respected people, uh, to come out of this area. Um, and, and it's, it's been really, really awesome to watch. Awesome. Go check it out. Uh, keep an eye on their social media. See yeah. when you can get a chance to see that either in person or online, mm-hmm. of course. And, uh, where can they find you online uh, yourself? Yeah. Um, Facebook Marcus Mann with two N's. Um, find me there. Uh, Twitter, I, I goof around on a little bit. Um, that's at Marcus Mann BHS, uh, for the Black Hand Society. Um, two ends on that. And then Instagram, I think I'm the Markman six because everything else was taken randomly. I don't know how, like, I don't really know how, but it was all like all of the like cool names were taken already. And I was like, man, I got it. I got an Instagram way late like way late. Um, I, Instagram is like a goof off Twitter. 
Yeah, most of my stuff you're going to find on Facebook. Facebook or Twitter, that's pretty much my right. social media of choice. Go check it out, and go check out all the wrestling interviews we have with the Indie Mayhem Show on IndieWrestling.us or over on WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Please subscribe. And again, hit us up with anybody you think we should be talking with uh, in the near future. So uh, until next time, thank you everybody for joining us live as well on Indie Wrestling's uh, Facebook page. Had a lot of great views here on a random uh, uh, scheduled uh, interview here on a Wednesday afternoon evening. That's all um, I care about is the ratings. They, oh, the ratings are, are pretty decent tonight. <laughs> so, for what it is. So, uh, thank you, everybody. Until next time, please support the oh. U.S. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.